Aren't you glad to be in church tonight? You made the best possible decision. Wow. You did. And some of you may have thought, I don't want to be here. I don't want to come. But you need to say tonight, I made the best possible decision. Whether you wanted to come, you came out of obligation, whatever it might be. But how many of you know he meets us right where we're at? And every time we come, I've never regretted a time that I've sown to the Spirit, whether it be through coming to prayer, a church service, whatever it might be. It may be hard getting there, right? But afterwards, don't you always say, I'm so thankful I came. Why? Because God always meets us right where we're at. Amen. I just want uh, Chris to play for a second. I just want us to close our eyes. I just saw us doing this before we get into the word tonight. And just take a moment to just quiet ourselves. How many of you know sometimes it's good to just quiet your mind, quiet your body, quiet the noise down, and just say, tell the Lord you're thankful. Whatever comes up in your heart, you may be having a lot of a big load, then cast the whole of that care onto him tonight. It may just bubble up in you just giving thanksgiving to him then just do that. Just with your own mouth, with your own heart, let's just take a minute here and just center ourselves on him, okay? Thank you, Lord. And I just heard this as I was praying on the way over here, just where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And there may be some of you tonight that are needing healing. And I just saw just by faith, you just take that. You know, sickness and disease is bondage. And what does it say? Where the spirit is, there's freedom. Well, guess what? The spirit's here tonight. So if you need healing, it may be in your body. It may be in your mind. It may be in relationships. Whatever it might be, just receive that tonight. Because why? The Spirit's here to give you that. And what is it? It's just simply receiving, by faith, I receive my healing. So if that's you, then just say that. By faith, I receive my healing. Thank you, Lord. We give you praise tonight. We thank you that it says where two or three are gathered, there you are in the midst of us. So we thank you tonight as we come before your word. You're here. You're here with us. And just like Jake shared that scripture, when the word is preached, it brings what we need. So thank you, Lord. We're open tonight. We're open to receive the word that you have for us. And Holy Spirit, we welcome you here tonight. Breathe on this word. Illuminate it to us. We thank you that we see clearly tonight that the entrance of your word brings light. So where there's been darkness, we thank you. Your word brings light. It's truth, it's clarity to us, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Aren't you thankful for his spirit present? He's so good. Okay, so we're going to get into the word tonight. And um, the title for tonight's um, message is Pay Attention. How many of you have ever had maybe your mom or a teacher say, hey, pay attention. Y'all are going to have to respond tonight. I like response. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. Michelle's good at responding. Um, where they've said, pay attention. And why do they have to say, pay attention? Because you're not, right? <laughs> I have to say that frequently to my boys. Pay attention. And you're talking, and then you look over, and it's like, they're way over here. Or it was just today I was talking um, to, to Caleb in the car on the way to school in the morning, and um, I was just sharing just some words that God's spoken over him and talking to him about his life. You know, And it's one of those moments where you're like, oh, I'm just believing this is penetrating, but he's really kind of you know, paying attention, so I'm like, oh, good, and we're driving in the car, and he's sitting in the front seat, and talk, you know, I'm just talking, and I, I'm looking at the road, you know, driving, and I am just keep on sharing, and all of a sudden, he goes, oh, my gosh, look, there's a ladybug. <laughs> and 
And he was talking about some cloud in the sky that looked like a ladybug. And he was pointing it out. And I'm like, okay, Holy Spirit, you are doing the teaching. <laughs> but what did I need to say? Hey, pay attention. Pay attention. Why? Why do we have to say pay attention? Because there's distraction. And for all of us, it's different distractions. For my youngest son, it's in the morning, it is animals. Before he gets dressed, before he fixes his hair, before he does anything, he is eyeing the window for animals, for creatures. And it's all the time. Caleb, what did we say? You can look for animals, but it is after you get your shoes on, after you are dressed, after your teeth are brushed, like everything is done. Then I don't care if you look. In other words, pay attention to what we've said first. How many of you know sometimes God has to tell us, hey, pay attention to what I've said first? Why? Because things want to get in to distract away from what? What he's told us. So we're going to talk about paying attention tonight. Proverbs 4, if you have your Bibles, we'll start there. Proverbs 4, 1 through 2 in the Amplified. It says, hear, my sons, the instruction of a father, and pay attention in order to gain and to know intelligent discernment, comprehension, and interpretation of spiritual matters. For I give you good doctrine, what is to be received. Do not forsake my teaching. So what could we say he's saying here? Hey, listen to what your father said. This is Solomon talking. And, but we can equate this to what the Lord is telling us. He is our what? Father. He's our father. How many of you know our father has some things to say? Some pretty important things to say that are going to be what? Good for us. How many of you, your mom and your dad, had some things to say that, are good, that were good for you? And in the younger years of our life, we could have been frustrated. But now on the other side, when we've reached adulthood, we're like, thank you. <laughs> thank you for teaching me those things. Thank you for showing me those things. Why? Because they matter. Why? Because it helped me in life. But what did I have to do? I had to choose to obey those instructions. So what do we see? The Lord gives us instructions, but whose job is it to follow those instructions? It's my job, right? He doesn't come down and force us and say, you must obey. But what do we know? He says, there's life, there's blessing. Choose life. He tells us what to choose. Here, he told us what? Don't forsake my teaching. What's that going to mean? There's opportunity to let go of what he said, what he said, right? Let's go to verse 10 in that same passage, please. It says, Hear, O son, and receive my sayings, and the years of your life shall be many. How many of you want to live long and fulfill the days on earth that you were meant to fulfill? Well, how does that come? By doing what he says to do, by following his word. Amen. Proverbs 4.18, let's look at that. Also in that same chapter. It says, but the path of the uncompromisingly just and righteous is like the light of dawn that shines more and more brighter and clearer until it reaches its full strength and glory in the perfect day to be prepared. So what do we see? The path of the righteous, what? Shines brighter. If we want our path to shine brighter, what do we have to do? We have to stay in the light. What do we know the light is? He is the light. The word is the light. What does it say? Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So what do we know? The more we get distracted to pull away from his word, the darker it gets. And how many of you know in darkness... It's not easy to see, is it? What happens if we're in this room tonight and all the lights just get shut off? Well, I kind of by memory can kind of know the sanctuary, right? A little bit, maybe enough. But isn't it going to be different walking around in the dark? And even though I have a memory, a knowledge of what this room carries, of what it looks like, where the chairs might be, how many of you know if it's pitch black, though, my memory may fail, I may get a little disoriented. Left to myself in a dark room is not going to be good. Right? Well, in life, left to ourselves, our own knowledge, what's going to happen? We're going to stumble. We're going to fall. But what does it say? The more that we get by the light, the light of his word, what happens? It becomes clearer. 
So when we stick to the word, what happens? Things in our life, maybe issues that we are, we're having, confusion, dark areas. What, what do we need more of? The light. The light of his word. So what do we have to do? We have to fill ourselves with that light. That's my job to do, isn't it? God's faithful to come. He's faithful to give me words. Aren't you thankful for that? But we can't just live off of him just giving. We have to do some work. <laughs> we have to do some digging for ourselves. Okay. Um, so let's talk about this. If you know that someone's going to call you, if I say, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a call, and we may, may, maybe don't do that very much nowadays, right? A lot of it's through text. But say someone says, hey, I'm going to call you, what do you do with your phone? Do you put it by you to make sure when that person calls that what's going to happen? I'm going to know that they called, right? Well, what happens if I keep my phone away from me? And that person calls, and then, have, have you ever had this happen? I tried calling you like 10 times, <laughs> right? And you didn't answer. And you know what I could say? You didn't try calling me 10 times. But what's the truth of the matter? They called me. What was it? I just wasn't paying attention. I didn't have my phone by me. So it's not the fact that the person didn't call me. <laughs> Thanks for that agreement and enthusiasm. <laughs> <laughs> I think people are pointing fingers and like, <laughs> right? We can't do the blame game and say, you didn't call. It's, I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> didn't come through, no service. That's very rare, Zolly. But how many of you know, there's a lot of things the Lord is trying to get to us. And sometimes we can be frustrated in saying, you didn't, you didn't, you didn't. But really, maybe it's the fact, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't. I wasn't paying attention. The blame game doesn't work to point it to God. <laughs> so we always have to look and go, you know what? I need to be paying attention. I need to be attending to his words. I need to be, what did, what did um, Jake say just in the offering? Not just a hearer, but a doer of the word. I got to hear the word, but I got to do the word, right? So if we want to be led, if we want to be paying attention to his voice, it starts by what? Acknowledging him. Knowing that he's speaking. We have to know that he loves us so much that he speaks to us. He's not a far off God. He's not, we're wondering if he's telling me what to do today or can I hear his voice. We have to know because he loves me, he's speaking to me. He's always speaking to me. Like there's always a phone call. There's always a text. There's always, that's why Jesus had to leave so he could give us the Holy Spirit who's what? With us always. To do what? To tell us what the Father is saying. So if we want to be directed by him, it starts with acknowledging him. So we, we said this earlier, but why, do, why does the Lord have to tell us to pay attention? Because there's going to be opportunity for us to not pay attention. If you're driving on the road, what are you supposed to be doing? We're all guilty of texting. We're all guilty of not, not paying attention, right? But we hope that everyone on the road when we're driving is paying attention, right? Otherwise, what happens? Calamity, destruction. Bad things happen when what? We're not paying attention. Well, you know what? And I believe even with the Joseph Morris, Morris services, I'm going to say Uncle Joe. That's what he told us to call him. With those services, it, and, and even this past Sunday with Pastor Nate, it's like God's sounding the alarm to what? Pay attention. Pay attention to the time. Pay attention to what the enemy's trying to do. Be alert, like awake. We shouldn't be walking through life right now as the church, as the body of Christ, asleep. 
What's he called us to do? To be up and what? Awake. How many of you have ever been like in the grocery store and people are just totally oblivious? <laughs> There's nothing that like tests your patience. <laughs> Miranda every day. <laughs> God bless you. Um, but where it's like, do you see that there's any other human being around? Like we went to Disney World a few years ago and I was about to pull my hair out because people, especially like, no offense toward other countries, but they just have a, every country has their own like culture and dynamic thing. Apparently, America is very fast-paced because all of the other country people <laughs> were not paying attention to how we do it here. And I was like, I am about to lose myself on these people. Just, they take up the whole space and they just, lol. I mean, I'm like, I'm glad you're at, in America and I'm glad you're at Disney World and I'm glad you're having a fun time with your family, but move out of the way. <laughs> Not paying attention. We're called to pay attention. Okay, God isn't going to force us to pay attention, but he does tell us um, and gives us the choice to decide what we want to do. He gives us the choice. He's not that person like me. Pay attention, pay attention. He's telling us pay attention, but then he says, hey, the choice is yours. I'm giving you things to help you pay attention, but the choice is yours whether you're going to do it or not. Romans 8, 5, let's look there. It says, those who live according to the flesh have their mind set on what the flesh desires, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their mind set on what the Spirit desires. So what do we see here? There's vying for mind time. There's vying for what? For your attention. Whether it's going to be put toward the world and fleshly things, or whether it's going to be put toward what? The way of the Spirit. So there's a tension there. 1 Peter 5.8 says this, if we can, it says, Be well balanced, temperate, sober of mind, be vigilant and cautious at all times, for that enemy of yours, the devil, roams around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to seize upon and devour. So what do we see? It's easy to, for a lion to seize and attack something that's what? Not paying attention. So what is this telling us? Hey guys, be sober, be vigilant. What is that saying? Pay attention. Pay attention to what? The way the enemy wants to work. What did we just hear on Sunday? Through what? Offense and strife. That's not the only way he comes, but we know that's a major way, and it's a floodgate <laughs> for the enemy to do what? Every evil work. So that's a major way that we have to be what? Watchful, vigilant. That we don't let that come in. But there's other areas, like we could say lethargic, where the enemy wants to come in and just cause us to be kind of not productive. Not really just kind of going through life. The other way he can come is where you're really driven, but it's driven on you, focused on you, yourself, your world, your life. So what is all this? All of these are areas, and he'll speak to you. You know, some of those may, may have spoken to you, but the Holy Spirit can be showing you other areas where, man, I need to pay attention there. And you know, something in an area where I need to pay, be paying attention may not be a struggle for you, and vice versa. But you know what? The Holy Spirit shows us where we need to be paying attention, and maybe where we haven't been paying attention and the enemies come in. So we're to be awake and alert, be on watch. Okay, so last week, Uncle Joe said um, that, he, he said it actually several times, he said over this house, a renewal of assignments. Do you guys remember that? 
So I'm going to read what I had wrote down in my journal. A renewal of assignments. We are in a season of rekindling of graces and gifts being used. Amplified voice in this season. He has something for everyone to do. Great grace upon this church. Amplify their voice in this region. So a renewal of assignments. So what is that? That's like an awakening. That to me says pay attention. That to me says God's wanting to do a work through us for this region, right? Amplifying our voice for this region, for this city. So what are we going to have to do? We're going to have to not only pay attention to these words, but we're going to have to pay attention, be awake and alert to what God's doing. What does that mean? Individually and corporately. Right? So inside this corporate body is made up of what? All of you and those who aren't here tonight. Right? Make up beyond church. Well, there's an assignment for you individually. And then there's also an assignment for us corporately. And you know what? We can't do the corporate assignment if the individuals don't grab a hold of their assignment. Right? So this word is for us to say, okay, a renewal of assignment. Lord, what is that? What is that assignment for this season that you've given me? And he'll illuminate that to you, but then it's what? Operating in that grace. What is that? He's given us the empowerment now to do it. But what's it going to take for us to pay attention? So I could take this word, renewal of assignment, and you know what? It's great going on for a week or two and then just let it drop. And what is that? That would be now paying more attention to earthly things instead of spiritual things, right? So in this season, all that God's wanting to do, amplify our voice, renewal of assignments. What did we hear? Jesus is coming back. We're supposed to be harvesting. We're supposed to be reaching the lost and bringing them in, right? Laying hands on the sick, seeing them recovered. All of this requires what? For us to pay attention, to what the Spirit is saying. Hebrews 10.25, it says this, Not forsaking or neglecting to assemble together as, as believers, as is the habit of some people, but admonishing, warning, urging, and encouraging one another, and all the more faithfully as you see the day approaching. What's he saying here? Hey, pay attention. Pay attention that there's going to be something trying to pull you out of what? Coming together. Because when I assemble together, what happens? I'm encouraged. I'm admonished. There's a strengthening to do what? My assignment. So I have to what? Pay attention because if I don't pay attention, my flesh, the world... (laughs) society's busyness is going to pull on me to do what? You don't have to go. Less commitment. Like Jake said, what? We live in a society of non-committal. Well, guess what? The church should operate more commitment. That's what we see here. The world's spirit is no commitment. The church's spirit is committed. Fully committed. So what? We're a body, we're a house who's fully committed. Fully committed to what? His plan, his assignment. Assembling together. Why? So we can be strengthened. So much so that when we see others are pulled out, we reach out and say, hey, hey, don't forsake the assembling. (laughs) Now's not the time to pull out. I love that it says, and all the more faithfully. What does that tell me? We should have more faithfully attending people. Why? Because I know what time it is. Why? Because I'm paying attention. Now's not the time to draw back. Now's the time to do what? We talked about two weeks ago. More faithful. Where's my faithfulness at? Am I faithful in my church? Am I faithful to the assignment that God's given me? Am I faithful to what? Sit before his word and do what? Pay attention to what he's saying. Now is not the time to draw back. Now is the time to press in. But guess what? There's going to be a spirit operating trying to get us to draw back. 
which is why we need one another. Why? When I come, okay, just think about this. And people say, oh, that's just, your, that's your job because you're pastors, you have to be there. Mm-mm. It is my job, but I don't have to be here. I choose to be here. I get to be here. Right? That's our attitude. That should be our attitude. I get to come to God's house. I get to gather. I get to assemble. I get to read the word. I get to serve. I get to use my gift. I get to minister. I get to lay hands on the sick and see them recovered. Right? It's a whole mindset. This is the way of the kingdom. Not half-hearted. What is it? Wholehearted. Wholehearted into what I'm doing. Wholeheartedly invested. Okay. And he talked about this. When you see the finish line, you don't go slower. What happens? You go faster. Well, guess what? We're looking at the finish line. (laughs) Jesus is coming back. Guess what? That's the finish line. How many of you, I've, I've run a couple races, and it doesn't matter how tired I am. When I see that finish line, it's like, oh, buddy, kick it up. Right? You're, you're kicking it in full gear like, I am finishing, and I'm finishing strong. Well, you know what? That should be the mentality of the church. I'm finishing. There's the finish line. I'm finishing strong. I'm all in. I'm giving it full gas. I'm giving it all I got. And he said this, and I loved it. Heaven is saying to the church, come on, do the will of God. Can you picture that? What does it say? They're cheering for us in heaven. So not only do we see the finish line, we're in the race, the finish line is there, but how important is it For those fans that are on the sides, you see that in races, and you see the people that are like, oh, you know, especially like marathons where, man, they're like dehydrated, and they're cramping, and their muscles, and and what are the people going, oh my gosh, what's your problem? You look horrible. You're not going to (laughs) finish. What kind of people would that be? (laughs) American. (laughs) But what are the people doing on the sidelines? You can do it. Go, finish, strong. You got it. Don't quit now. You're right there. You're right there. Guess what? That's what the body of Christ in heaven is saying. Come on. You're right there. You're right there. Don't quit now. Don't quit assembling now. Don't quit reading the word now. Don't quit paying attention now. Come on. You're right there. Finish strong. When you're in the end of a game, you're paying attention. You're not distracted. Now, I use sports a lot because I like sports. But in a game, at the end of a game, if you had the quarterback, there's just a few minutes left, and he's over, like, eating chips and not paying attention. I mean, what would happen? The coach would be, like, shaking him. What is your problem? Pay attention. Do you see the clock? That's what I feel like the Holy Spirit's doing to us in a loving way. But, hey, put the distractions down. Put those things down. Those things that I've been telling you, it's really time to put them down. And it's really time to not be distracted and to give your all in the game. This is it. Right here, this life, we have one opportunity one opportunity <laughs> to do the will of God in this life. So what am I going to what is my life going to represent Christ in this life? In this life. And what does it say? It's but a vapor, but you know what? This vapor matters. What I do in this vapor matters into all of eternity, and I only get one shot at it. And we were just talking to the boys last night because I loved his analogy of talking about, 
you know, at the judgment seat of Christ and we'll be judged not with sin, right? We know that. But we'll be judged according to what, we, what we've done for him. And those things that last are what? Eternal things. And what did he talk about? The motives of our heart. I loved that. That was so good. But he talked about, you know, like special stitching or like you see in the military. I don't, that general doesn't have to announce all of his accomplishments and what he's done. What speaks for him is what? His medals, his honor, the, the stuff that's put on him. Well, we'll have that. It's going to speak for us. And I don't want to be walking around with just a plain white robe. Like, I, I want to show that I live my life for Christ. That I did what he asked me to do. That I didn't quit. That I didn't give up. That I paid attention to the times. I paid attention to what the Spirit's wanting to do. You know, he's always wanting to do something. Always. Always. Every person you come in contact with when you're out, the Holy Spirit is always speaking. It may be praying just in your heart. It may be reaching out towards someone. It may be sending a text. It may be giving to a cause. It may be whatever it might be. But you know what? We're to be being used. Okay, Second Peter 3, 1 through 7, and this is out of the message. And it says this, my dear friends, this is now the second time I've written to you. Both letters are reminders to hold your minds in a state of undistracted attention. Keep in mind what the holy prophet said and the command of our master and savior that was passed on by your apostles. First off, you need to know that in the last days, mockers are going to have a heyday. Reducing everything to the level of their puny feelings, they'll mock. So what's happened to the promise of his coming? Our ancestors are dead and buried, and everything's going on just as it has from the first day of creation. Nothing's changed. They conveniently forget that long ago, all the galaxies in this very planet were brought into existence out of watery chaos by God's word. Then God's word brought the chaos back in a flood that destroyed the world. The current galaxies and earth are fuel for the final fire. God is poised, ready to speak his word again, ready to give the signal for the judgment and destruction of the desecrating skeptics. But this is what I saw here. It's, it's like a mocking of, I've heard that. I've heard Jesus is coming back. I've heard I'm supposed to pay attention. I've heard, I've heard all this. Nothing's changed. I don't want to be one of those. And, and what did he say here? My dear friends, this is now the second time I've written to you. To what? What did he say? Reminders to pay attention. This is a reminder to pay attention. Okay. So I love this too. God doesn't just give us his word and his Holy Spirit to tell us to pay attention. But you know that the earth that he created is telling us to pay attention. We're so busy now because of, you know, heads, heads down a lot of times. But I encourage you, look at creation sometime. Like, take a minute and pause from your phone. Pause from the television. Go out at night and look at the stars. Go out in the morning and look at the sunrise. Look at the sunset. Look at a bird flying across your yard. Look at a squirrel playing in the yard. Look at something. Want to know why? Because creation speaks. His creation speaks. Did you know he created? He created that for us. So if, if he created the mountains, he created the trees, he created creatures, he created plants, he created the sun and the sunsets and the stars, all of this. If he created it for man, do you think there's something in it that we need? Do you think it speaks to us? God will speak to you through his creation. And there is so much that he can do through that to minister to you. And take time to pause. We're so on the go and busy that we totally neglect creation, the beauty that he made. So not only that, that's a separate topic. But also, what do we see? That we've seen signs in the heavens that's saying what? Pay attention. What have we seen? The blood red moons, the Bethlehem star, all that stuff that he's named. All of creation is what? Saying, 
pay attention. And we miss so much of it because we're so digitally, <laughs> you know, that we don't pay attention to the skies. We don't pay attention. But there is so much happening. Earthquakes. All of these things all over the world that what? It's saying, hey, wake up, guys. Something's about to happen. So not only is his word telling us it, but nature and creation is saying, hey, guys, pay attention. There's signs. Okay, um, and I, I, I want to read this um, out, of, out of this book that I had. And this is just a book about God's glory, but I just found it um, so fitting. And this is by um, Pastor Hagen, which is Brother Hagen's um, son. It says, in these last days, we must not be complacent about the glory of God, just sort of sitting around and waiting to see what God will do next in the way of a move of the Spirit. We must get a revelation of what, what God wants us to do. We must be fully equipped to reach the lost and dying of the world with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we must be ready when the Lord Jesus returns for his glorious church. I am beginning to see that we who call ourselves charismatic have let the glory of God wane in our midst. We, and I'm talking about all of us in the body of Christ, must not do as the Israelites who lost their enthusiasm concerning the glory of God. They became apathetic in rebuilding God's temple, where God's glory would dwell in its fullness. And they became more interested in their own dwelling places or in natural things, the affairs of everyday life. And we're going to read here Haggai two, uh, 1, 2 through 4. It says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, These people say, The time has not yet come that the Lord's house shall be, should be rebuilt. Although Cyrus had ordered it done 18 years before. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you, for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house of the Lord lies in ruins? So what do we see? They, they came out of captivity. They were supposed to rebuild the temple or God's house. And it hadn't been done. 18 years had passed and God's, God's house still hadn't been touched. But guess what had been touched? All of their homes all of their ways, all of their personal, personal. Okay, I'm going to read quite a bit out of this book, so, but just stay with me, okay? So it says, Now at the time of this writing, the Israelites had returned from Babylonian captivity and had already built houses for themselves. God said in verse 4, Is it time for you yourselves to be living in paneled houses while mine remains a ruin? However, some 16 years after their return, they had not yet rebuilt God's temple. Now, God is not against us living in nice houses, but it is more important that we build his house. Until we do, until we put first things first concerning the things of God, we are never going to see his greater glory. Um, and then he says this, what does it mean first things first? One thing I believe many people need to change in their individual lives is an overemphasis on material things. We all need to get our eyes off ourselves and stop taking the attitude, what's in it for us? Instead, we should be asking ourselves the question, what does God want? And then count everything else as worthless in comparison to his will. We need to let go of some things we've been holding on to, afraid that obeying God's perfect will might mean losing some earthly benefit. We must get our eyes off material things and on the things of God. I know you've heard it before, but it is a fundamental truth, so I'm going to say it again. We need to put first things first. And I just thought this was so, so good. And then um, if you can turn to Matthew 6, 33. And this is, uh, we all know this verse. It says, but seek, aim, and strive after, first of all, his kingdom and his righteousness, his way of doing and being right. And then all these things taken together will be given you besides. So what do we see is supposed to be first? What are we supposed to be paying attention to? His kingdom. Okay, I'm going to read um, here. It says, well, what is the kingdom of God and his righteousness that we are supposed to be seeking? Basically, it's God's will or his way. For example, after they'd been released from captivity, God told the Israelites to rebuild his house, his temple. Well, to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness would have meant obedience. It would have meant to set aside natural earthly things for the time being in order to take care of his interests. 
Instead, they sought first their own well-being and left the task he'd assigned to them undone. They intended to rebuild the temple, but they wanted to do it when it was convenient for them, not when God wanted it done. What can we learn from the Israelites in Haggai's day? It seems they became focused on themselves and on material things. In the process, they put off rebuilding the house of God. And if we're not careful today, we too can become more involved with our personal lives than with the things of God. It seems that some today have become indifferent to the things of God and to his will and plan for their lives. Spiritual things are no longer a priority. They are more interested in furthering themselves than they are in furthering God's plan and his work, ushering in his glory and the return of his son. But we have a divine commission to reach a lost and dying world with the message that Jesus Christ gave his life so that we may have life and have it more abundantly. John 10.10. And then I'm going to skip a few pages here. Um, In Haggai, we see a people who had made themselves their priority. They were not showing the reverence toward God and toward spiritual things that they should have shown. There is danger of that happening in the church today, and that is why I'm writing this book. There is a move of the Spirit that will be lost to us in this generation if we fail to heed the word of God and the prophets of old. Friend, we each have a work to do. The Spirit of God is within us and upon us to accomplish our task. Say that. The Spirit of God is within me and upon me to accomplish my task. And he desires to manifest himself as never, never before in our midst and in the presence of the whole world. So let us seize the opportunity to obey God and to cooperate with the flow of his spirit. Let us seek God as never before so that we can step out fearlessly and proclaim his gospel with signs following. So that we can take our place in this great and gathering of souls throughout the earth. And I just thought uh, that was so good. And um, I want to... I want to read Haggai 1, 5 through 7 in the Amplified here. Haggai 1, 5 through 7. And it says, Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways and set your mind on what has come to you. You have sown much, but you have reaped little. You eat, but you do not have enough. You drink, but you do not have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages has earned them to put them in a bag with holes in it. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways, your previous and present conduct, and how you have fared. And I just found it interesting in 5 and 7, he says, give careful thought to your own ways. In other words, what could we say? Pay attention. Pay attention to what you're doing. Pay attention. And one of the things that we have to guard is being distracted and getting our attention off the plan and purpose of God. And what do we see? I love what he said in there, that their intention, their intent was to rebuild God's house. But what happened? Their plans, their self-care got in the way of what first doing what God had asked them to do. So it's good uh, from time to time to ask ourselves, why are we doing the things we are doing for the kingdom of God? So maybe write that down. Why am I doing what I'm doing for the kingdom of God. What's, in other words, what would we say there? What's my heart motive in what I'm doing? Do we do it to be seen, to please others, to check a religious box, or are we doing it for God? Do we do what we do because we love him and are thankful for what he's done in our lives? And I think this is key. Is what I'm doing for him because I love him? Because if what I'm doing for God isn't because I love him, I need to check my heart motive. What I'm doing in life and what I'm doing for the kingdom of God, what I'm doing in my local church, what God's asked me to do outside of these walls, if what I'm doing isn't because I love him, that's, that, that's cause for heart check there. If what I'm doing isn't because I'm so thankful for what he's done for me. Like when I come to serve at church, when I come to serve, if I'm not doing it from a place of love and thankfulness that I've been found, that my family's blessed, that I can gather here, that I'm here and he, he sustained me this week, 
then I need to readjust and pay attention to my heart. And with God, it's all about heart. And that's why I love what he, uh, Joseph Moore said of, it's all about the intent of my heart. Why? Because God sees that. I, I can fake all day on the outside, but who knows the inside of my heart is God. And the motive of my heart is he sees that. So am I living life and doing what I do for my benefit or for the kingdom of God? So we see God didn't tell the people in Haggai to consider their ways and pay attention and then not tell them how to do it. He brought correction followed by instruction. And we're going to see that here. When God comes with correction to us or just readjustment, realignment, it always comes with instruction and direction. He doesn't just come and say, hey, don't do that. <laughs> he, he doesn't just correct us. His correction always comes with an instruction of what he wants us to do and a direction. So Haggai 1.8. So he came and talked to them what? About not rebuilding the temple, about rebuilding their houses before his house. And then he says, this is what he's, he's, he brings correction. And then he says, hey, now here's what I want you to do. Go up to the hill country and bring lumber and rebuild my house, and I will take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified, says the Lord, by accepting it as done for my glory and by displaying my glory in it. And so what do we see? He not only came with correction, but he came with instruction. He reminded them again. So he wasn't just saying, hey, pay attention, but now he's telling them how to pay attention. Here's what you do. Here's what I want you to do. Go down and do this. And then um, if you go further down in Haggai 1.12, it says they obeyed and they did it willingly. And I love that. So what did we see? They intended to do it. It's not like their hearts were hardened where they're just like, we're not going to serve God and we're not building his temple. It was just neglect. It was the busyness of life. It, they forgot. But then what did, what did we see? God came in and said, hey, this is what's going on. Now this is what I want you to do gave them instruction, and then their hearts were tender, and they willingly obeyed, and they did it. So once the Israelites understood where they missed it, they began to obey the Lord's command to rebuild the temple and began putting first things first. So what did they do? They readjusted their priorities, and they said, okay, we're not going to put ourselves first, our houses, our, our life we're going to do what God said, and we're going to rebuild his house. We're going to take care of his house because that's what he's told us to do first. And how many of you know when you seek first his kingdom, that whole passage in Matthew 6 is talking all about provision. And what's he saying? When you seek first his kingdom, all these things, well, what are all those things? Up in earlier in the chapter where he talks about clothing and food, and you don't have to worry where things are going to come from. Why? Because he's going to provide. So I can trust knowing, Lord, when I put my whole self, my family, everything I'm doing into your kingdom, you're going to take care of me. It's all about priorities. It's all about heart. Okay. Um, and then I did want to read this, Haggai 2, 4 through 9. So this is the next chapter over. So after they've obeyed the Lord in rebuilding. And then he tells them this, yet now be strong. Alert and courageous, O Zerubbabel, says the Lord. Be strong, alert, and courageous, O Joshua, the high priest. And be strong, alert, and courageous, all you people of the land, says the Lord, and work. For I am with you, says the Lord of hosts. According to the promise that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit stands and abides in the midst of you. Fear not. For thus says the Lord of hosts, yet once more in a little while I will shake and make tremble the starry heavens, the earth, the sea, and the dry land. And I will shake all nations, and the desire and the precious things of all nations shall come in, and I will fill this house with splendor, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. The latter glory of this house with its successor to which Jesus came shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place will I give peace and prosperity, says the Lord of hosts. And I just love this because it's just a picture of God saying, okay, we got the priorities right. We did first things first. You guys came, I came to you with instruction and correction. You guys went down, you rebuilt my house, 
You've adjusted your priorities, and now what's he saying? Boom, now I can move. Now I can move among you. And I, I just feel like this is what God, he is so wanting to unleash his power and his glory, not just in this house, but in the body of Christ. Why? To reach. And what does it take? It takes us putting him first. Okay, um, let me see if I want to read these here. Okay, and it says this. Remember that back then the glory of God dwelt in the temple and the holy place, the holy of holies. But where does God's glory reside today? In the body of Christ, in us. If there is going to be a manifestation of the greater glory today, you and I are going to have to do something about it. It wasn't God's responsibility to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. That task had been assigned to God's people. And today, it is our responsibility, not God's, to stir ourselves up, to put him first, and to esteem spiritual things over earthly material things. What am I saying to you? I'm saying when God deals with us, and I believe that he is dealing with us now, there's going to be a shaking of our priorities, and the greater glory is going to come. There will be a greater visitation of God's power and presence than we have seen yet. But it will come with a price, the price of our time and our earnest desire to seek his face and to know him. It's the price of our obedience to move when he says to move and to sit still when he says to sit still. Will you pay the price? And I just thought um, that was so, so good. And then um, I did want to read a little bit of this. Um, He talks about just um, the title of this chapter here is... uh, Let me turn back. It says, taking the torch, following in the footsteps of a chosen generation. And um, he talks all in here. um, There's a few pages where he just talks about basically from the time of Jesus all the way until now, how generations have taken taken the, the word of God, have taken and obeyed it and not quit. And that you and I are here today because of the previous generation. You and I are here today because they didn't quit because they continued on and caused God's word to go forth. And um, he just talks about um, how Jesus came, and then you see the the apostles. And then it says in the third century, the early church um, of Alexandria and others took their places in God's great plan to propagate the message of his saving grace through Jesus. In the fourth century, it was Augustine. Um, and they became prominent figures in church history, had a great impact on their peers and future generations. Um, In the Dark Ages, a remnant of brave Christian heroes held on to the truth they'd learned until the Reformation in the 16th century, at which time Martin Luther held high to his generation the bloodstained banner of the Lord Jesus. All these men were obedient to take their places in God's plan to pass on their knowledge of God to future generations so that the fires of the Holy Spirit would not be extinguished. Um, And then he talks about in the 1700s how John Wesley um, was a major person in the move. Um, Let's see. I want to go through all of these. Um, He said in the 1800s and into the early mid and 1900s, men and women of God such as F.F. Bosworth, Maria Woodworth Etter, John G. Lake, Amy Semple McPherson, Charles Parham, Charles Price Smith Wigglesworth, and many others continued to carry the torch of faith. These are all people who are cheering for us. Isn't that amazing? To think all of these saints of old who finished and passed on the torch, now they're cheering for us. Uh, Gordon Lindsay, who knew John G. Lake personally, testified to my father that in one five-year period in Lake's ministry, more than 100,000 healings were documented. Lake was known as the modern-day apostle of faith to Africa. Um, And then he talks about Brother Hagen, how he was saved at the age of 15. Um, He was later healed off of his deathbed. Um, let me see here. And then he said, I was present in many of Oral Roberts's services, and I have vivid memories of those evangelistic uh, meetings in which countless lives were changed by the glory of God. In my mind's eye, I can still see and hear Brother Roberts as if it were just yesterday. Then in the mid-1950s, although no one had done it before that we know of, a couple named T.L. and Daisy Osborne went to the nations, renting soccer stadiums and filling them with crowds of people who came to hear the gospel preached. Others said it couldn't be done, but they did it successfully. And signs and wonders were wrought on behalf of thousands by the power of the Spirit. 
But none of these exploits could ever have been accomplished had not men and women afire with the flames of the Spirit in their heart carried the torch in their time. When you are willing and obedient to carry the torch of the glory of God, there is no such thing as the word impossible. Right in the middle of this tremendous move of the Spirit in the mid-1950s was a man by the name of Kenneth Hagin. Because of his great love for God and people, I truly believe my father was the greatest man to walk on the face of the earth. I would not trade my godly heritage for anything. Dad never had a tent or went to the large auditoriums to hold meetings because the Lord told him to go to the churches. He'd go to various churches and hold meetings that lasted up to eight weeks or longer. He took his time and taught the people so that they could learn how to receive from a giving God with the hand of faith. There were countless others who took part in this great revival of the 50s. They are the precious men and women of God who passed the torch to our generation. And then he talks about the healing revival that gave way to the charismatic renewal. The Full Gospel Businessmen, Businessmen's Association began, headed by Demas Shakirin. Many of us, or our parents or grandparents, came out of that movement. The charismatic renewal was a time of great outpouring, and I think that among others, two of the greatest leaders and proponents of that movement were my own father and John Osteen. The charismatic renewal rose from a desire to break away from dead, dry, man-made religion and to worship the true and living God. But I think we as charismatics have become so accustomed to our ways of doing things that we have our own fog and smog of tradition. It's time to wake up. It's time that we, with our tear-stained faces, climb the hill of God and rise above the fog and smog of our own traditions. We need to take up and carry the torch of the true move of God. Again, the fire of the Holy Spirit needs to burn brightly in our lives, and the message of faith in God needs to be preached stronger than it ever has before. In the 1980s, that message was fresh and strong, and it was preached without apology or compromise. Churches grew robust and became deeply established on the truths that were taught. And anyway, um, he, he just goes on there to, to talk more about it. But I just love seeing how every generation <laughs> there is passed down and how they didn't back away. Even though something seemed impossible, what happened? They were paying attention. Those people, it's like where they said the, the Osbournes and going across to the nations and filling stadiums. Do you think that was just like they were paying attention to what the Spirit was saying? And what God was needing them to do. They had their spiritual antennas, you could say, up. And we are to be that. And I want to end with this, Luke 4.18. It says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the good news of the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to announce release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to send forth as delivered those who are oppressed, who are downtrodden, bruised, crushed, and broken down by calamity. And we know that this is Jesus, um, Jesus speaking. But I just saw this, that this is something we have to own. This is something that we have to say in our time, that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Like, I'm going to carry my torch. I'm, in a sense, I'm going to carry, I'm going to be up and awake. I'm going to be paying attention to what God is saying and what he's doing and how he's wanting to use me. Why can I do that? Because the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. To do what? It's not, the Spirit of the Lord isn't upon me to just sit in church and come every week and get goosebumps and go, Oh, God's blessed me. Isn't he good? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to do something. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me when I see someone who's hurting to help them. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me when I see someone who's sick to lay hands on them and see them recover. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me when someone has a need and I meet it. Or a word of encouragement, whatever it might be. What, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, you fill in the blank. But it's upon me to do something in this time. And if we're really aware that Jesus is coming back and that our time is short and we're on the finish line, then we should be up and awake to what he's saying, what he's doing, and just making that personal commitment to him of, Lord, I'm surrendered to you. Just like they did. What, what did we see the, the Israelites do in the book of Haggai? God came with instruction and correction, and it was just a realignment of what priorities and so I just want us to close our eyes tonight as we close. 
and just some time uh, with you and the Lord and just a realigning. And this, this isn't like a hard thing. This is a good thing to just realize, man, the time we're living in, where we're at, Jesus is coming back soon, and I need to be paying attention. I need to be awake and not be distracted. And if it takes readjusting my priorities, I need to do that. Like, what priorities do I need to readjust? Or what things do I need to let go or pick up? Or what areas, where, where, and this is just a time, and we're just going to let um, Chris play here, if we can turn the keys up. And um, I just want this to just be the next minute or two, just between you and the Lord. And you just act like no one else is here. Just it's a time for you and the Lord to connect. So, Lord, we just worship you tonight, and we do tonight. We just center our hearts on you, and we just say you have first place. You have first place in our life. We look to you. We just tell you tonight how much we love you, and we serve you because we love you. We give because we love you. Thank you, Lord. You're everything to us. Thank you, Lord, just a spirit of refreshing tonight on this body. And even those who aren't here tonight, we just, we just say refreshing and strength be in Jesus' name to do the will of God. Thank you, Lord. Nothing missing, nothing lacking. Nothing missing, nothing lacking. Thank you, Lord. We just worship you tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we love you all so much. I know that's not like a hoorah ending, but I believe God will speak to you. Amen. As you go to sleep and just continue. To what? Have our spiritual antennas up to pay attention to what he's saying. Amen. And pay attention to those around you because God wants to use you to those around you, even in the body, not just outside of the body, but in the body, how you can stir and bless one another. Amen. So we love you all. Have a good week. And we'll.